You are listening to the first mailbag of season eight. These questions came to me via the contact link over at kyleferguson.com, through the Discord, which you can find a link to on that website, and by tweeting at me, at Kyle Ferguson, two S's in Ferguson. There will be a second mailbag at the end of the season, episode 10, so if you don't hear your question here, be on the lookout for that future episode. Let's dive right in with Christopher, who has a multi-layered question about their campaign as a new DM. The first part, how do I write slash plan an overarching story that is more important than the random independent quests, but still give the group all the freedom that is cool about D&D? The easiest way to go about this is to create a sort of breadcrumb trail across your otherwise would-be random independent quests. Each of those smaller adventures share an element. Your quest may also be tied together simply by the fact that it is all happening to one town. If one town is under attack by goblins, zombies, and lizard folk, well, there's a good chance there's some sort of mastermind bringing these different evils together. This is an extremely easy method to use if you want to have a very short campaign. In just five sessions, you can tell a complete story, showcase three different locations, three different enemy types, and then bring it all together with a final two-part session where they face the final bad guy. I often use this method with new players or players who are only in town for a short amount of time, maybe like a summer vacation sort of thing. And because they're often new players, my final bad guy is a dragon, usually a young black dragon, which is challenge rating 7. And the excuse there is very simple. Either the town itself was once a roost for black dragons, or there's something about the town that makes it a very appealing roost for this young black dragon who's trying to assert their self and their place in this world. In order to clear the town for their future home usage, they have employed the goblins, a necromancer summoning zombies, and a tribe of lizard folk. Of course, being evil, there's no guarantee that these alliances are going to hold once the black dragon would win anyway. So they're not at any loss should their forces be defeated on the way there. If you're looking for something more organic or you want the players to choose what their main quest is going to be, provide them options and let them choose the type of independent quest they'd like to go on. You will realize very quickly the type of quest your players like. They might be drawn to certain enemy types, in which case you can reinforce that story and build that into your greater campaign. Or they might be really into certain locations. Every quest you provide with a temple is one that they jump at. So now let's make a clear all the temples kind of storyline. Sometimes all you need to do to figure out your main story is listen to your players. You give them an emerald. Just for currency, you expect them to turn it in for gold. But instead they all get really excited. They think there must be other secret gems hidden around. What do the gems do? You weren't planning this storyline, but now, now you embrace it and your players go on to collect the seven gems to save the world. Sometimes campaigns are just started by the fact that you did a voice that was a little too creepy for an absolutely normal person. Now that NPC is suspect number one, and you might as well embrace it. The danger with this method is, of course, that you might have too many breadcrumbs spread all over the place, and you might struggle to bring them together to a single focal point. If the players love collecting gems from temples, but have also invested themselves in that goblin, zombie, and lizard folk storyline, you may have to perform some mental gymnastics in order to work in that black dragon alongside this now collect the gem story that seems to be taking place. As long as the players still have that feeling of freedom as you get deeper into your main quest, you've done a great job. The second question, how do I handle the friendly NPC was the big bad guy all along? How much do I hint at it without ruining the reveal. And what would I do with a natural 20 inside check, or similar premature reveal of the big bad? You only get one twist per campaign, and this one is a big cash-in of all the trust you've built up with your players. If it's at the end of your campaign, then you don't have to build your players back up. You don't have to re-establish trust on the other side. A lot of this just comes down to simple self-control on your part as the DM. Let's say a goblin begs for their life, said they'll never do anything bad again, and the players let them go. It is very tempting to bring that goblin back again as a bad guy, but that would be a break of trust. 
You are informing your players that they should kill every goblin and bad guy they ever meet because there's a chance that they will come back. DMs love to accuse players of being murderous, however, they often get the players they deserve for the type of world they've made. And it sounds like here you want to save that reveal for the end, which is why you have concerns about it being discovered along the way. Luckily, thanks to video games, mainly MMOs, people are very trusting of quest givers and interactive NPCs that don't join them for the actual mission. It is not suspicious to the players when the NPC doesn't want to join them on the actual adventure. They're just handing out the quest. And in that way, you can use the exact same method we talked about with the dragon. Except instead of a dragon, it's the friendly NPC, who is working with the goblins, who is having the players go defeat that necromancer and bring them his staff. Why does he need goblin necklaces, a necromancer's staff, and an ancient rune from the lizard folk? The quests by themselves are quite innocent, but altogether the items can construct a portal to a dark realm that the NPC wants to bring monsters out of. You could stack more layers of trust on this. They're the governor, the king. Maybe they own the tavern. Now you're on the path to finding your story. You start answering those questions you've posed yourself. Why does the tavern owner want to release darkness on the town? Maybe the players in session three of our five-part campaign discover the tavern owner's family history, spurring the players on to confront the tavern owner. Here you have a legitimate concern about that being revealed outside of your control with something like a natural 20. But realize a natural 20 doesn't mean they're mind readers. It's easy enough to just give a natural 20 roller a lot of information, even though that information might not be valuable. They notice the way the tavern owner feels, how they look different today, they look worn. It doesn't mean you give them all the answers to the puzzle going on. You could also use that natural 20 as a chance to reinforce your main quest. With your natural 20, you realize something's off here. What is the connection between goblin necklaces, necromancer staffs, and lizard folk rune stones? Perhaps the court library might have some answers. And now we didn't reveal our big bad's plans or their secrets, and the players feel like they have a clear heading after their natural 20, that they got the answers they desired. If you find yourself still concerned that your players might accidentally reveal everything early, you can pull some soap opera tricks. We're all very dismissive of amnesia or dormant personalities, but they're very useful in these exact situations. Maybe that friendly NPC is possessed, and the entity inside only takes command in certain times. When they're interacting with their friendly NPC, that NPC has no idea they're being controlled in their off hours. In the case of our tavern owner, they're only slightly possessed. They know they want these items, but as they collect them together, they descend further into their possession and madness and become that big bad. And the final question, what undead end boss encounter can be appropriate for a level 5 to 6 group for a first time campaign. Naturally, I love this question because I love the undead, but you probably figured out for yourself that the pickings are pretty slim when it comes to undead in the level 6 and above range. In fact, there's a huge gap in undead enemy types all the way from level 5 to level 13. There are tons of lesser undead options, but we jump all the way up to vampires before we're back on the undead campaign train. Take note that challenge ratings are not necessarily one-to-one -to, -one to the player levels. A level 2 Minotaur Skeleton hits so hard that it can one-shot level 2 players. And two Minotaur Skeletons might be a perfectly good challenge for three level 4 players. A lot of that is going to depend on the type of group you have how they control the battlefield, what sort of heals are available on their kits, and what their overall damage throughput has felt like. There are also strategic factors to think about. A level 4 Flame Skull can be very easily defeated by level 4 players. However, if you put it in an advantageous position on the map, the terrain chokes the players together for fireball spells. There are minions out in front of the Flame Skull, allowing it to just play the artillery role rather than the tank role. Those sort of game design decisions greatly influence how your players are going to interact with that monster, and whether or not it's going to be a fun, difficult, and rewarding final boss battle.
For instance, it may look like the Beholder Zombie at challenge rating 5 is the perfect fit for what you're looking for. However, if your players haven't already dealt with the lesser Beholders, or aren't going to go on to fight real Beholders, then using the Zombie Beholder as a boss is going to just feel like a mess of new mechanics that they have to learn on the fly. Same goes for something like a Wraith, which has tons of damage resistances and sunlight sensitivity. If your players haven't dealt with ghosts on the road to this final fight, that'll feel cheap for them. Think about the fights that they've experienced so far and what they've kind of struggled with up to that point. Do they struggle versus spellcasters? Well, then that flame skull or a bone naga might be exactly what you're looking for. Do they struggle when they receive damage? Well, then a council of four minotaur skeletons might be exactly what you need. If you find yourself scared that the fight might be too easy for them, or if a certain spell might succeed and trivialize your fight, then you can think about multi-staged bosses. Maybe the boss battle starts with a white and his zombie companions, but once the white is defeated, the spirit is released, and now they have to fight that wraith. Without knowing your party's makeup, its damage throughput, or their hit point totals, I can't make an exact recommendation, but don't shy away from using lesser challenge rating monsters combined in interesting ways to make your final fight. Shoral writes, Do you spend time listening to your players theorize and or plan at the end of a session? And do you come up with ideas for later, even a lot later, based on those things? How do you incorporate those players' theories into your world if you do? I always love listening to my players talk after the game session is over. I love hearing their theories about the day. It's just rewarding as a DM who has spent a lot of energy performing for the last several hours. While flattering and fulfilling, it's also extremely useful. You get to hear your player's version of the day's session. What they thought was important. What they think is going to happen next time. Sometimes they had really, really good ideas. Sometimes there was a fundamental misunderstanding in the session, and correcting it is going to be more work than just going on that ride. Sometimes players get so jazzed on an idea that it would just be cruel to skip it the next session. This sort of thing often happens to me if I'm presenting anything involving water. I tell them they're going to a beachside temple, and the druid gets really excited that they can transform into a fish, or that the party is all going to buy potions of underwater breathing. The temple was on the beach. There wasn't going to be an underwater level coming up, but they're just so excited about it, and they're so prepared for that underwater adventure, the plan has changed. That temple is now moved off the beach into the lake. But Shoral here is more talking about lore, and that's where we get into interpretation. Unless your game is being recorded or presented in front of an audience where they're going to correct the players or call them out or have questions why something changed, your player's interpretation of the world and the facts is most important. There's nothing wrong with correcting a name that has been mispronounced, or if a player wrote down the wrong name in their notes. But if they fundamentally believe the king is the villain, then you should play with that expectation either by playing into it or using it as a direct red herring situation. If your world is so concrete in its facts that the player's interpretation can't evolve your world, then your world might be a little too rigid. You are losing that aspect of joint storytelling that makes it all the more rewarding for everybody at the table, as well as just easier on you. Now, if you're asking, what should I do about my players having bad theories about my world, or ones that aren't correct, then you might need to set up a sort of oracle scene. These can be a little heavy-handed, like Dumbledore at the end of Harry Potter, but they do provide the players with answers to their question in character, rather than feeling like the DM is so uptight about their world, they have to correct them outside of the game. On that note, it's all the better if your players don't think you're really listening to their theories, because then you have a chance to surprise them. Keep an ear out while you're dividing up the XP, giving out loot for the day, processing their gold. That's when you'll find the players truly in that theorizing zone and presenting ideas that are useful to you. I'm going to choose to pronounce this name Dekion. Dekion asks, When starting a campaign, is a session zero one of the things you like to do? If so, how do you generally run one? 
Do you try to encourage a balanced group, or simply plan your challenges around the party your players come up with? For a more long-winded answer on Session Zero, you can find Season 3, Episode 4, Hosting Character Creation. I really do like Session Zeros. The players get to know the world they're going to inhabit before they make their characters, you get to communicate your preferences, your desires for the game, and you get to avoid the pitfalls of characters stepping on each other's toes, whether that's similar backstories, similar classes, or just a group makeup that doesn't really work at all. But when it comes to making a balanced group, I don't really push the subject. You can encourage people to think about the Trinity if you want, tank, healer, damage, but it's not necessary for D&D. And in fact, I've played so much D&D that three spellcasters would be very welcome. Just a totally different kind of game we're going to be playing. All I have in my head going into Session Zero is a general preference for what I want to run this time. Do I feel like sticking with my old favorite monsters? Do I want to try a dragon campaign? Are we doing a post-apocalyptic world or a high fantasy world? It's not even a plan at this point, it's just what I think would be fun for me. Then my players' race choices, class choices, spell choices, ability choices start to inform that world further. Let's say I'm planning something very desert world, but somebody wants to be a boat captain. Water world is still in that wheelhouse, so we could push it that way. Or they could be a sand barge captain, and I can continue with my original plan. The only thing you should really be heavy-handed about in a Session Zero is how the players know each other. If it's a job board kind of world, then they're all just looking for money. Problem's already solved. But if you're doing the example from the previous episode, goblins attacking a town, you might need to help your players find a place in that town. One of them is a bartender. One of them is a farmer. What might bring their character to the marketplace that day that the goblins attack? That's not heavy-handed, that's just encouraging joint storytelling. And even if you got the perfect, balanced group, there's no guarantee your players know how to play those characters, or are going to play them with any proficiency. So just enjoy the ride. If you happen to end up with three martial classes and no spellcasters, that's a very cool surprise for you. You can now make a world where magic is evil or dangerous to use. If you get no divine classes, then you can do a world where the gods are dead. So keep yourself open and direct your players down the road you would like, but give up very easily. D&D Guru asks our final question. I just started running Rise of Tiamat, and one of my players is a centaur fighter that thinks every plan boils down to, who do I need to stab? Out of character, he says, I know I'm making things difficult, but this is what my character would do. But that doesn't make it any easier to deal with how he's playing. How can I get him to understand that I need him to work with me a little to make sure it's a fun game for the rest of the group, most of which do not enjoy combat? Sometimes these situations come up because of the DM's style. Their villain's monologues are too long. They always get away. Maybe, despite the long monologue, the villain still has an advantageous position for the upcoming battle. The players have been betrayed or tricked too many times, like we talked about in the first email of this episode. Maybe your combats are just really difficult and hard. So the players react by trying to stab everything first, before it gets a chance to get away, before it gets into that advantageous position. This doesn't even have to have happened in this particular campaign, but in your past campaigns that you've run as DM for this player, you've performed these sort of deeds. And so, hearing they're starting a new campaign, they made a character that would be resistant to your machinations. Not saying that's what happened here, but it's worth searching your memories to see if you've caused this outbreak of stabbing. Here, though, your player has admitted that they're being difficult, but it's what their character would do. In this case, they're not only being frustrating to you, they're breaking their contract with their fellow players. In fact, Gary Gygax once said in his book Roleplaying Mastery, always seek to contribute the most to the team's success. From the player's and PC's standpoint, any roleplaying game is a group endeavor. 
Individual success is secondary to the success of the group. For only through group achievements can the quality of a campaign be measured. That was from 1987, and sounds real nice and is very true, but it doesn't help you confront the player causing this issue. Ultimately, they are not entitled to ruining other players' fun or ruining your game just because it's what their character would do. You can remind them that they're getting no advantage by attacking in this moment. They still have to roll initiative. They get a turn like everybody else. They're not going to get a surprise round by interrupting this conversation with an attack. It can be tempting to try to solve this in-game by peace bonding their weapon, making a home-ruled spell where the whole group has to even agree that the player can unsheath their sword. But that just causes more drama and more tension. Ultimately here, you have all the cards. You pick and choose the players at your table. Remind this player that they're breaking the contract of cooperation with their allies. If their allies prefer to avoid combat, then they're warping the game for their own means. That doesn't mean they can't be eager to fight, joyous when they get to pull out that sword, and revel in the battle after. That's not a big ask. You can still have a rogue obsessed with riches that doesn't steal from the group. You've already tried to confront this player about this issue, but they're still not getting how they interrupt the group's play. This can still be a very fun character. This centaur wants to stab all enemies all the time. Can they present that in conversation as an option? Try to work to convince the rest of the group that this NPC needs stabbing. That can lead to a lot of really fun roleplay. See if you can take them down that path. Otherwise, the rules are on your side. They do not get that free attack. They need to roll initiative in order to fight. And the other players, also rolling initiative, have a chance to interrupt our stabby centaur here. To hold his blade back, to grapple him, and avoid that combat forcefully. But now we're starting PvP, we're limiting what the player can do, and things are just going to get messy. So first, check your own campaign. Make sure that didn't make this character the way they are. That you didn't cause this issue in the first place. Is your world confusing? Do the players not know who the real villains are? And this particular centaur has turned to violence in their confusion. Have you given them an outlet for their combat? Do you need to define an enemy that is worth stabbing for them? Second, talk to the character, and this seems where you're at, about how their character is breaking the cooperative contract with the other players. And third, get the other players involved in the conversation and see if together you can tone those behaviors down, or if there's a way we can have fun with the character type without forcing combat on the rest of the players. This is not an easy situation, but you hold all the cards. And if you have to get out the big guns of dismissing a player from your table, it might be the healthiest thing you can do in the situation. Every long-term DM has had to kick somebody off their table. It sucks, but it's an important tool in having fun with this hobby. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. And thank you to everybody who wrote in. This show is supported by the patrons over at patreon.com slash kyleferguson. You can find more about this show over at kyleferguson.com. Music was by Brian Griffith, and I will see you all next week with a new topic for DM Gives Inspiration. Inspiration.